All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. This is Sparks to Skyscrapers, episode 11. Finally back in the country. I studied abroad last semester, so we're back in the familiar You Imagine Center. I'm here with newly anointed president of our sinus college, Robin Hannigan. Thank you for being oh, here Oh, thanks for having me. Um, I'm already excited because you're a Boston, a Boston lady. I so am a Boston patriot. girl, yeah. so I'll put on my accent for you. Yeah, so what brought you down here? What? Well, I came via Potsdam, New York. Okay. So I was in Boston where I founded the School for the Environment at UMass Boston. Go Pats. Yeah, right, right, go Pats. Um, and then I got the job as provost at Clarkson University, which is a tech. Okay. And I was there for three years through COVID. Whoa. Yeah. Um, and then decided, you know, between COVID and the racial reckoning of summer of 2020, I was like, you know, if I'm ever going to be a president, now is the time. And then looking around the kind of institution I wanted to be at, some place that would really let me um, kind of sharpen my entrepreneurial teeth on yeah. higher ed. I was like, hey, your sign, this is the one. Yeah. And so since you've been here, have there been any challenges of like, things you wanted to accomplish that you, you've you hit some roadblocks? And if so, how did you overcome those roadblocks? Like uh, maybe entrepreneurially or just any any yeah. goals that you had coming in that have been more difficult than you realized to accomplish? So I think the good thing about being an entrepreneur is I, like I come in with an end game, right? Like yeah. my exit strategy, Right. this is where I want to get to. And then I'm always ready to pivot, right? So I think when I first started, I was just pretty open of like, I don't know what's possible here. Let me figure out what, what toys we have to play with. Yeah. And then you put them together and you figure out where you can go. And I think for an entrepreneur, we're so used to taking risk. Other people won't think that way, right? So, so I had to learn to balance the conversations I was having where I embrace risk and get excited about it. Other people less so. So I sort of had to get people used to that and then pivot away until I could come back yeah. to stuff. So what previous entrepreneurial experience did you have to this? So I had, I started three startups, all of which exited successfully. So wow. um, the first one, well, they're all with my students. So that's another cool thing. Interesting. Um, so the first one was sort of like a chemical widget that allowed you to connect two instruments that never talked to one another to force them to talk to one another. Interesting. That was, um, became a company called Hyphenate Solutions. And then that was bought by Perkin Elmer. And then second one was Geomed Analytical that was taking all the stuff that we do with lasers and then turning that into a biomedical um, diagnostic sort of technology. And that was um, bought by Resonetics, which is a laser company, and they own that. And then the third company is started off as more of a blood testing sort of quest diagnostic -y thing, but okay. using um, oral fluid instead of blood. Oh, wow. And the technology that we developed in order to be able to do that, that technology now is being used. I sold that company to another company whose name I can't disclose. All good. They are, they are making- <laughs> Don't get yourself in trouble. <laughs> they're making lots of money off of that. Off of so, your idea. Yeah. That's always but, Well, I mean, it's, it really wasn't, it was my, so that's a cool thing about entrepreneurship. And, and for me, I never, I'm a founder. I never wanted to be the CEO, mm. or, you know? So my exit strategy was always five years, have enough um, market demand and enough product competency that we could just get out and sell it to somebody. So you say you don't want to be the CEO, right. yet you I'm take a, over yeah. an entire institution. <laughs> That's right. So what's your exit yeah. strategy? I mean, to my own one? Yeah, I do. I'm gonna, I mean, I'm getting older, right? So my exit strategy is eventually Still I will retire. fantastic. You know, you're looking old. <laughs> Eventually I will retire, right? And so my exit strategy for for this job is to position or sign us successfully into the future so that when I do retire, the next person who comes in has a platform that they can then build on. Yeah, and, and building off of that, um, and you mentioned your, your science background and your mm -hmm. environmental background, um, did you have any ways coming in that you wanted to innovate like sustainable practices on campus, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, 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 that's, so, a, that's a sweet yeah, spot. Yeah, go for it. So we have, um, you know, one of the great things about Ursinus is you really have a very, very, we, we have a very strong sort of environmental studies focus uh, at the intersection of the sciences and policy. And that's academically really strong, but it hasn't act successfully threaded itself through all of the activities in the institution. So in the fall, I signed the Okanagan Charter, okay. which then brings health and well-being of people, place, and planet together with sustainability. Now we actually have a chance to innovate in that space and mm. to become a higher educational institution where everything we do is sustainable. So supply chain, um, you know, really simple things like let's use recycled photocopy paper if we're gonna print stuff out. 
um, all the way to we have a ton of impervious surfaces here. And we should define have, impervious surfaces for people that oh impervious know. surface just means you know how you spill water if I spilled water on this table yeah. it would flow across the surface yes it wouldn't actually go in yes it's impervious yes so here when it rains and you guys know this when you walk around campus so when puddles. it rains you get puddles all kinds of terrible places if we had more pervious surfaces you wouldn't get that but since we have a ton of parking lots let's cover those with solar panels and actually start generating energy from them so and in. And when we build, instead of using regular building materials, let's use building materials that help us sequester carbon from the environment. So that sort of stuff. All very interesting. Directions that we're going. That um, rainwater garden. That's and what cool. is that? Yeah. So that's actually a student's project to capture rainwater and allow us to reclaim it and recycle it. Um, that's one step. Then we're going to be putting some, a, what's called a hugel garden over in that area. That's going to be mounded gardens that'll have native plants on it that'll also help pull some of that ponded water that we usually get, pull it into the ground. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm going to be a senior next year, so I might be gone before a lot no, of stuff. Yeah, I think the hugo gardens are going to get done this summer. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you'll be able to, nice. and they're going to have like little benches around them and you can sit there and watch the butterflies flying yeah. around if that's what you're into. Yeah. I mean, I love a good butterfly yeah. bird washing session. Right. <laughs> So you mentioned these students' projects. Mm -hmm. uh, these students are obviously very impressive, but coming into college, there's a lot of people um, that might not know what they want to do at Ursinus, mm -hmm. and then building on top of that, myself included, there's a lot of people that are getting close to graduating that yeah. still don't know what they want to do with their life. Yeah, me neither. So, <laughs> so what advice would you give then uh, to both uh, the student coming in that doesn't know what they want to do and then the student leaving that might not know what they want to do? So for a student coming in, I mean, I was a first-gen I, my exposure to college was Animal House, like I pretty much was sure that's what college was. Yeah. Um, and for a large part of my college career, it was Animal House. Um, but I really didn't know like what to major in, so I changed my major like five times. So one thing to remember is you can do that, change your major yeah. all the time. Um, I think getting getting yourself comfortable with saying yes to stuff, right? So I could not agree. Right when you're when you're asked to go somewhere, just say yes. I it, could not it really, agree. I promise you, it won't kill you. Just say yes. My sophomore year, I same thing. It was like I, I was I'm not really feeling comfortable at her sinus yet, and I just literally that was the strategy that I adopted. I was like, I'm just going to start saying yes to everything. I'm not going to say no to anything. Right. And my experience and dramatically improved. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then so the the student leaving. Um, that yeah. So I think it's it's important to remember when you're leaving here that. Whatever job you imagine yourself getting after graduation, you imagine, very, right? That you very imagine, right? Plan words. Hey, how about that? <laughs> <laughs> that 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 is actually not the rest of your life, right? So, don't hem yourself into you know I got a degree in finance, therefore I got to go into finance. No, get a job, get the skills that you need from that. Realize, ah, I hate that, and <laughs> change, right? So one of the things that's great about this time in in the world is that you're expected to change your job all the time. This and so true. that's the beauty of your science education is you're prepared to do that. So again, I guess it's say yes. Yeah. Right. So building off of that, where do you see opportunities for students at our sinus um, to innovate? Everywhere. Right. So I think that a lot of people think that innovation means I have to start a business. It doesn't. Right. So there's a lot of social innovation that happens. And so for me, innovation is where do you see that there's a need? And what do you need to do to fill the need? Mm. So that could be that you see the opportunity for a new student club. Create that new student club you've innovated, right? And then if it's sustained, you've actually changed the college in a positive way. And it's also looking outside. If you're looking at Collegeville and looking at your you know, surrounding environment, mm -hmm. see like where, where is there a need that aligns with my interests? And doesn't mean you have to be perfect at stuff, right? But give it a shot. And, and sometimes I've, I, when I, what I love about you, Imagine Center, is the students that are pulled in from all these different disciplines. Yeah, all the different backgrounds. I mean, we have the posters right? up yeah, here the posters where it's, up there. you know, photography, clothing, me, the awesome. podcast, lacrosse, more uh, artwork. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. And, and their major doesn't necessarily line up with what oh, they're proposing. Right? Nope. And that's, that's what an entrepreneur is. Someone who's not risk averse, someone who sees opportunity, sees a need, and knows how to pull together a team to solve that need. Yeah. You seem very, like... You seem like nothing phases you. Like, mm -hmm. was was it daunting, you know, accepting a job, a position as the president of a college for the first time, you know, in the in a role like this? Was were there res reservations that you had? Oh, sure, yeah. And, and how did you deal with that? And how did you make yourself, you know, comfortable enough to to actually take that? Leap? Well, sometimes it's faking it till you make it, yeah. right? So, for me, I mean, of course it's daunting because you've got 
you know, an institution that's 160 something years old and it's being put in your hands and everybody's looking at you yeah. saying, what are you going to do to make it better? Um, and so realizing that although those are the words people use, everybody understands it's a team effort. And so knowing I wasn't coming into this alone, in fact, I had the entire college community with me. I, I felt better about it, yeah. but it's still, you know, every now and then you're like, wow, really? Me? Yeah. Have you met me? Yeah. You know? It's like imposter syndrome. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think, you know, growing up the way I did, where I was the first one to go to college yeah. and grew up in a trailer, like not much was expected of me. Um, there's always that person in the back of your mind that goes, are you sure that you belong at that table? What town? Where was the trailer? So I grew up in um, Narragansett, Rhode Island. Okay. And so the trailer was right. I, I had it. So I had beachfront property. I grew up on the beach. Yeah, it's but great. It was just it was a it was a triple wide, so it was really nice. Oh. Yeah. Well, I so I'm. <laughs> I mean, hey, a triple wide better than a double wide. I right. so, yeah, right. <laughs> um, so just like I want to go go back in time a little bit, then and uh, talk about your upbringing. Sure. But what kind of things did you do growing up? What were you interested in? Sports? Did you? Were, was it some more school academic? Oh uh, no, I was a terrible student. I was the worst. Um, How'd you spend your time? Uh, uh, outside, getting really, really dirty, um, crawling around in the mud. Yeah playing on the beach, swimming, a lot of swimming. Um, mostly playing with rocks, so that's why I ended up in geology. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yes, but I, I like to ask this because, I kid you not, I, I, we learned this um, fr from a mentor of ours that came in and helped us with the podcast. Yeah. Uh, they told us to ask about the backgrounds of our guests and like their childhoods, and, yeah. and I kid you not, he, he told us this at the time, but it's been true. Every time you ask how someone grew up and what they were interested in doing, uh -huh. there is a tie-in. Oh, yeah, what sure. Doing. I could tell totally you 100% of the time. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's never like, oh, I grew up in all the way in left field, and now I'm doing this. It's all, there's always something. Yeah, there's always some connection Even if it's a it. skill. Yeah. So, I mean, we had a guy, um, Ryan Martin. Shout out Ryan. Hello. <laughs> in front of the podcast. <laughs> um, he, it was, it was, he works for, um, at Bora Stitch, which is a stitching company yep. down the road. And he was saying, you know, he grew up learning disabled. And, uh, you know, school was really challenging for him. And it's, you echo a similar... Yeah, I have a learn. I have a superpower, so I'm yeah. dyslexic. Oh wow! Um, and so that meant that the traditional things that were happening in the classroom weren't working for me. But as soon as you gave me something to do with my hands, exactly, I was fine. And that's exactly what he said. And that's why now he's what's he doing? Stitching, right? With his hands, right. sewing with his hand. And yeah. so you know, it's it's intriguing, definitely. Um, yeah. So. Your role, I don't even know the company. I just saw on your resume, Chief Science Officer. I was Chief Science Officer in the three startups that I had. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. So uh, what were some skills then that you learned with those startups mm -hmm. um, that you're now applying here? Uh, one is that when you are in a startup, you are not just a Chief Science Officer. Like, I was a Chief Science Officer, but I was also the janitor, and I was in charge of payroll. And so it was really like whatever job has to get done, you have to do. And so that's something that I bring in here is that I'm willing to jump in and get dirty when, when work has to get done. I'm not just sitting up there in an ivory tower. Yeah. You know, yeah. so that's, that's one. Um, another one is realizing that it's, it's, not so, it's more about the team that you put around you than it is you and the work that you're doing. So the chief science officer, the geniuses that I hired made me look really, really good. And you're just telling them. Yeah, I, I didn't tell them anything. I, I would come up with some crazy idea. Yeah. But they were the ones who actually made the idea happen. So to me, they were the geniuses because yeah. I could never have made half the crazy things that I came up with happen. Yeah. Um, okay. So then, building off that, what what advice would you give to your past self? Um, maybe you know mistakes that you made, or or even just you know advice moving forward. Uh, if you had to go back and, and give yourself advice, what would it be? Um, probably I'd go back to probably my high school, early college self and tell myself that um, I should keep doing exactly what I'm doing and enjoy myself and not stress out about the grades yeah. or where I'm going to end up because even then where you thought you were going to end up is not anywhere near where I ended up. So don't worry about it. Yeah. I mean, that's... I've had, you know, when I ask this question, I get that answer a lot, yeah. and and every and I struggle with that, and you know, with you know, I'm worried about well, there's all a lot of pressure on you right. to graduate, but yeah. I know, and I hear that, and I know that what you're saying is is what I should be doing, and that I know that I shouldn't, I should be enjoying it, and I should, you know, really soak everything in. Mm -hmm. But it's easier said than done. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah. what, what maybe some strategies that, that are just or just do it. Uh, <laughs> I, well, I think you just have to. 
you have to know yourself, right? Yeah. And so I think I knew myself well enough to know that if you had said to, if I, if, my, if I went back to myself now and said, hey, you need to study harder, that was never gonna happen. Sure. So I knew myself well enough to know, like I'm not gonna tell myself that. What I would tell myself is to be more confident earlier because I really didn't get my feet under me until probably my early 30s. Mm. If, if I had gotten my feet under me earlier, I could have done even more. Mm. Right. Very nice. You're, you're good at this. Thank you. You did a good job. <laughs> um, okay, I kind of want to ask a few just a wrap-up questions, just sure. to, maybe that students are wondering about stuff on campus, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm kind of coming up with these ones on the spot. Okay. And I'm, I might not even include this one, but I'm, I'm, curious, cool. I'm curious about it. Right, so uh, w since, since I've been here and since COVID, the social situation on campus has drastically changed um, from before COVID to during COVID until now. Uh, what direction do you see like campus events moving to? Um, do you see maybe that pre-COVID lifestyle coming back? Do you see it moving in a different direction just out of curiosity? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of conversation about normal, right? And what's normal and post-COVID there, there's a new normal, right? And so I don't think that we should look back pre-COVID and say, gosh, I wish we could go back to that. You're not gonna ever go back to that. Um, what I would say, what I would like to see is students, that there are more events on campus, that students feel there are more opportunities to engage with different groups of their peers yeah. in different ways, but that I want the students to know that that's entirely in their control. We will support whatever you come forward as long as it's not, you know, going to get us in trouble. Right. But you don't want the institution to be building that framework. No, for you. no, yeah. absolutely not. And you know that's a great point. And that brings me to my next question, which is: there are a lot of groups of students that are in their groups of students, and that's the result of COVID. It I is, think, yeah. where the there, everyone, people? yeah, everyone kind of yeah. just sticks with the, whether it be you know their organization, their team, their fraternity, their sorority. They're just a group of friends that they met, and there's not a lot of branching out that maybe happens. Um, you know, I would like to encourage that, but I don't know what, how you feel about that. Do you think it's something that it, it's just up to the students, or, or do you think that there's strategies that can be used? Like, it's, yeah. it's tough because it's like that, you know, high school, college is like a weird time. It is very weird. And yeah. People don't want to branch out, and... You know, I'm a very outgoing person, but I feel like for a lot of people, it's not easy to branch out. No, and you don't know how. Yeah. And so some of it, the institution's responsibility is to make sure that there are pathways for students to build those connections. And if they're if they're not taken advantage of, that's okay, Yeah. as long as there are those pathways. So that's what I'm gonna focus on, is just making sure if you wanted to reach out, you could. Yeah. If you don't, then you don't. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I know you mentioned some of your goals um, earlier, but you know maybe in the short term, next couple of years, like right after this, what are you up to right now? What are you working on? Um, wh what initiatives? So we're finishing the strategic framework, yep. and that's really the guiding document for where we're going to go forward. Um, and there's KPIs, like the good CEO stuff that you bring in, like KP, key performance indicators yeah, yeah. and all that other stuff. Um, so this coming year, our focus is really going to be on retention. What do we need to do to ensure that students who enroll here are successful throughout the entire four years that they're here. Um, and then after that, it's gonna be, how do we revitalize downtown? We're gonna start working on that next year as well. Um, you know, So the goal is to really build out the retention platform, look at new academic programs possibly. Um, that's up to the faculty, but hopefully they'll look at some stuff. Yeah. But really just focus on the student experience next year. Amazing. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. Is there anything else that you, you have to say? The floor is yours. If, yes, if not, it's okay. No, right. other than I encourage everyone to think about what solutions you know they have yeah. to the world's problems. And don't be afraid to talk about them. Right. Talk about them. And, and you never know who you're going to meet in an elevator who might have the money to support you. This is true. That's why it's called an elevator pitch, folks. That's, That's why. That's why. <laughs> That's why. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much uh, for watching. This has been episode 11 of From Sparse to Skyscrapers. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you so much Thank you. for being oh, here, President Hannigan. And we will see you next time on From Sparse to Skyscrapers. Thank you. Okay.